Church of the Black Hills. We're so blessed and honored that you chose to worship with us today. You know, we are taking a, a short break from our relationship status series, and we take uh, the last Sunday of every month during the summer, June, July, and August, and uh, we go out 
to a park here in the Black Hills. It's Canyon Lake uh, Park. We rent a pavilion. We go out there for some food, some fellowship, and some fun. And uh, I just want to encourage you, if you are in the Black Hills area, we would love to see you next month. Um, but I got a short devotion, short word for you. And so I will see you at the park. Reading of the day, and I, and I come across the scripture. We've all read it numerous times. It's in Matthew uh, chapter 26. And those that are joining online, we are out at the park uh, today, uh, just enjoying food, fellowship, and some fun. But I don't want to pass up God's word, an opportunity for us to, uh, to grow in God's word. So it's Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start in verse 14. It says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas, went to the chief priests and asked, What will you give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now I thought this kind of I've read this numerous times, and I'm sure you have too. He went to the priest. The priests that were always looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus, to persecute him, to stop the ministry that he was starting, they didn't come to Judas. They didn't go and secretly come to Judas or any of the other disciples and say, hey, Come over here. Judas went to them. And I find that very interesting because they were always, from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he was going in and, and healing on the Sabbath, which was the no-no, they were always looking for that opportunity. And here, they don't go. They're, they are approached by Judas. Now, Judas was the money keeper. Out of all the disciples, he was the one that was holding the money. He was also the one that was had in his pocket with the money. You know, if we look at all the disciples and what they did and where they came from, you would think, why would Jesus pick someone that he knew was going to betray him? And then I started thinking, wait a minute. He picks us. And we're imperfect. We have issues, every one of us. Some are out in the open. Some are internally. But he chooses us. So why would it be any different? He loved Judas just like he loved Peter. Just like he loved the other disciples. Just like he loves us. And how many times we might not deny Jesus like Peter did, or go to the chief priests and say, hey, what will you give me for this opportunity? But what do we do in our hearts sometimes when we don't fully dedicate ourselves to Jesus? They say that the 30 coins, the value, and there's, there's an argument, historians and theologians, they argue about how much that was worth. Could have been five days wages, but it was no more than 120 days of wages, four months. And this is a person that walked with Jesus, was in the boat with Jesus, seen the miracles happen, and all these things, yet he still had greed in his heart. Greed enough to say, hey, I need some money. I need more. Because if you've ever dealt with greed, and I think we all have, even if we're a little child, and sometimes as we grow up, we don't grow out of that, but if, if you look at a, a kid in a preschool setting, and they see all these toys, and there's all these toys over here, but they want that one. Yeah. They want that one that someone else is playing with, and they're, they're greedy. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Mm -hmm. And if we're, we have greed in our hearts, what do we want? We want more. We want more. If that's not good enough, it's over here in the corner. I want this. Yeah. I want that. Proverbs 15, 27 says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family, 
but he who hates bribes will live. The New King James Version says, He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. I find it very interesting that Jesus knew that this was going to happen, yet he allowed it. It's no different than he knew that Peter was going to deny him in his heart, with his mouth, but he accepted him. And he allowed that to happen. Divided in heart. But Jesus was controlled by greed. And perhaps some resentment we see in John uh, chapter 12, verse 7. He, he offered the devil a foothold in his heart. He said, you know what? I've been walking with Jesus. I've been doing these things with Jesus. I see the miracles. I see the signs and wonders of God of heaven, all over this whole situation. But the greed, he couldn't get over it. It was so much in his heart that he was like, I am going to betray the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we might not do that in our hearts as far as money. Like, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? But what do we do in our hearts sometimes when we deny Jesus? We, we don't fully live for him. Or we do something and we're like, yeah, I can spend my time reading my Bible, but I want to go do this. Because, well, we, we get selfish, right? It's that greed part. I, I want this. There's a story about uh, Leopold II of Belgium. He was the king from 1865 to 1909. 44 years. He's actually the longest uh, king that has ever reigned. Of that country. At the age of 74, in his death, he had accumulated $500 million. A lot of money. He mainly got it, not from being a king, not from being a ruler, but from greed. You see, uh, Leopold was known as the cost of humanity. He was the first one that they ever dubbed crimes against humanity. How did he do this? Well, he earned his wealth in the rubber plantation of Congo. In the process, he killed some estimated 8 million people and maimed an unaccountable uh, number of men, women, and yes, even children. He did not kill for pleasure or for political or military gain. He did not kill with guns or swords. He killed for profit. He was so hungry for money because he figured if he had money, then he had everything. If he had money, he had power. If he had money, he'd be happy. And we all know you can have all the money in the world you want, but if you don't have a good heart, if your heart isn't right with Jesus, you're going to be unhappy. There's still going to be a hole in it. And we all know what happens. It's like a grain. You pick up a, a handful of sand and you hold it, right, real tight. What happens? It falls through your fingers. You can hold on to money the same way. Eventually, it's going to fall through. The more greedy you are, the more you have anxiety to hold on to it. The more you want to hold on to it. And what happens? It slips away. He was so caught up in profit, so caught up in money that he killed by overworking people, not feeding them, and punishment. His favorite was chopping the hands off of someone that wasn't meeting up to his expectations at the plantations. He did this because he wanted to say, prove a point. If you don't do what I ask you to do, then I'm going to maim you. I'm going to cut off one of your arms. I'm going to cut off one of your feet. He was sending a message to the other workers that, hey, if you're not productive and you're not making me money because I'm a greedy person, then this is what I'm going to do to you. The sign of others that they had to work because he was the greedy one. In the end, his wealth brought emptiness. In the end, He's going to face, he faced God for his greed. 
You know, we look at Hitler and we look at some of the Stalin and we look at some of these other uh, well-known uh, rulers that were, you know, war crimes and, and all these other things. But here's a guy, he didn't use guns or, or knives. He didn't use swords. He didn't, he didn't march a military campaign to take over territory. He just wanted money. I find it interesting that Judas portrayed Jesus for a few points. He didn't do it for millions of dollars. The chief priest didn't come to him and say, man, we will make you rich. You will never have to work a day in your life. You will live in a palace. You'll be able to go take this money and go buy and build a, a palace and just live a life of luxury. They didn't come to him with that. All he got was 30 pieces of silver. Like I said, there's arguments of whether it was five days wages or 120, but it doesn't matter. In the end, he felt so remorseful. He brings back the 30 pieces of silver and gives it to the chief priest. He's like, I don't want it. He realized he had made a mistake. How many times have we made a mistake? All he would have had to do, though, is just go to Jesus and say, I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Because he did it with Peter. Why wouldn't he do it with Judas? Because I think down deep inside, he was so remorseful that he, he thought that he couldn't be accepted again. So many times we make a mistake and we believe that what we've done is so wrong, so un we're so ashamed of it. So many people leave the church because they're ashamed and they don't feel that, that Jesus will ever accept them. They're embarrassed. They're like, what am I going to do? I can't face Jesus. And Peter, he, he felt terrible. He went and wept when he realized that the rooster crowed those three times. And Judas, on the other hand, went and hung himself. And that was not an answer. I believe that God wants us to open up our hearts and be remorseful for maybe things we have done and maybe things that you know we're ashamed of. But there is no way that Jesus won't accept us. No matter how bad our mistakes are. Because you know what? No matter how bad they are, they could not be as bad as having Jesus arrested. Knowing that he was going to be killed, knowing that the chief priests were out to kill him. And you go there with the intent because you're money hungry, because your heart isn't right. And I want to encourage each and every one of us today that when we feel ashamed or we feel like we're not worthy, we got to know that if Jesus could build his church on the rock, Peter, and what can he do in our lives? We're no respecter of person. He loves us just like he loved Judas, just like he loved Peter, just like he loved his other disciples, just like he loved the woman with the issue of blood, the woman that was caught in adultery. He loves us the same, but we've got to make sure that we are right in our hearts with God. I want to encourage us to self-reflect. Even though we make mistakes and even though we're maybe ashamed of some things or maybe we say, you know what, I'm going to dedicate, you know, we start the new year with New Year's resolutions and promises. I'm going to do better. I'm going to, I'm going to exercise more and I'm going to read my Bible more and I'm going to do this more. And then what happens? Come February, we're like, what happened to those New Year's resolutions, right? Don't make New Year's resolutions. Just... Keep that in your mind, but don't say them out loud, because a lot of times what happens is, right, they fall through. But I think we can speak life into our lives, into our hearts, and say, you know what, Jesus, maybe I haven't lived for you the way I should. And ask him to forgive us when we lack. And I think that he is going to Fill that void, fill that gap, and give us a hunger 
that's not going to be monetary. It's going to be a blessing of our lives. Amen? So I want to encourage you this week, um, go back, read chapter or Matthew chapter 26, um, where Jesus, or Jesus, or Judas betrays Jesus. And this is right before the Last Supper. You imagine Jesus is washing Judas' feet, knowing full well what he had already done. Yet he accepted them. He didn't call them out at that moment. He did say, one of you here is going to betray me. But he still washed his feet. I don't know about you, but if I know someone's going to betray me, I don't want to even be around. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, step back. Not Jesus. He accepts us no matter how dirty we are, no matter how messed up we are. He accepts us. And that right there ought to tell you how much he loves you and I. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can self-reflect. We can look in our hearts and see where we lack and we mess up and the things that we're dealing with. That, Lord, when we have voids in our lives, when we have voids in our, in our hearts, Lord, when we're greedy, maybe not monetarily, but, Lord, when we're greedy with our time, that we don't spend with you because we want to do something else that feeds our flesh. Lord, we ask that you would help us. Lord, that we would turn to you. We would repent. And Lord, knowing that if you can love Judas, that you can love us. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this gathering. We thank you for your word. Lord, let us be transformed in your image. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can we give God a new cup of praise? All right. So.